Simply put, spasticity stinks. Cramps, spasms, and limbs that are hard to bend are all too common in people impacted by MS. In this video, I'm gonna share with you how to beat spasticity. Don't turn away, because that starts right now. Howdy, and thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. Today, I wanna to talk about a very common and very, very painful symptom in MS, spasticity. Spasticity is a phenomenon where opposing muscle groups no longer coordinate their efforts or they're no longer playing nicely in the sandbox. Let me explain. If I wanna bring this carbonated beverage to my mouth, two things have to happen. This massive bicep has to contract, all right? It's gotta to shrink to pull my arm forward. It's gotta get smaller. Meanwhile, this massive tricep back here, it has to relax, it has to let go to allow my arm to come forward. Now, I don't say bicep contract, tricep relax, I just say, hmm, lemon lime. My brain and spinal cord coordinate activating the bicep and turning off the tricep. In the setting of multiple sclerosis or any neurological condition that causes damage to the brain or spinal cord, so that could be a host of things like strokes or cerebral palsy or traumatic brain injury, etc. When there's damage and lesions to the brain and spinal cord, it can interfere with the orchestration of those two muscles, the playing nicely in the sandbox. And when you want to bring your arm in and the bicep contracts, the tricep didn't get the email to relax. It didn't get the memo. It doesn't know what it's supposed to do. So while well, your bicep is trying to do this, your tricep is trying to do that. And the result is a tug of war across your arm. This manifests clinically as spasms. So a spasm is like a bouncing of a limb. Cramps, which is a visible contraction of a muscle belly like a charley horse, which is extremely painful. And thirdly, you can see limbs that are hard to bend. Damage along any part of the descending motor pathways can result in spasticity and it's extremely common in MS. To make matters worse, spasticity gets more intense when it's cold outside and when you are still. So let's unpack that. I talked to you here during the winter in Ohio. It's cold outside, and the vast majority of my patients are experiencing an increase or an uptick in their spasticity. The second thing that you can see that makes spasticity worse is being still. So you're still when you're driving, you're still when you're typing at your computer, and you're certainly still when you're asleep. And so imagine waking up in Ohio in February. It's cold outside, you haven't been moving all night, and you wake up and you're like Tin Man. It's really, really rough. Spasticity is painful. It can limit freedom of movement. It can cause contractures where the joint actually shortens and you can't open the limb all the way. And it can even cause decubitus ulcers because it forces limbs to rest in certain positions. Spasticity is nasty, but fortunately it's treatable. The rest of this video is gonna target how we beat the heck out of spasticity. Hey, real quick before we go on, I have a favor to ask. If you like this video, do me a kind favor and give me a thumbs up. And if you haven't yet, please consider subscribing to the channel. Those two actions help the YouTube algorithm realize that you dig what I'm doing and help push the content out so more people can learn and hopefully enjoy. Thanks a lot. The first thing we'd like to do when addressing spasticity is remove any noxious stimulus. A noxious stimulus like a hangnail or a decubitus ulcer or a bladder infection or an upper respiratory tract infection or constipation, any of these things will massively worsen spasticity. Once we've made sure that we've removed any noxious stimulation, we want to address the two things that make spasticity worse cold and lack of movement. Now, cold is challenging because even if you keep your house warm, it's still cold outside in Ohio, but there are some things that you can do. You can make sure that your car is heated up before you get in it whenever possible. You can make sure that your bed and your bedroom are kept amply warm. There are things that you can do to limit your exposure to the cold outside. Movement is an area that we really, really can benefit from. For starters, I would like you to stretch. Yep, I want you to stretch out, and I want you to do it three times a day. When you wake up in the morning, before you exit your bedroom, I want you to get on the floor a la track practice and stretch out your back, your butt, your hips, your hamstrings, your quadriceps, and your calves. I need you to hold each position for at least 30 seconds, otherwise your muscle never figures out what you're trying to do, and it may behoove you to do a couple repetitions. 
If that sounds kind of boring, throw in a yoga DVD or do a YouTube search for some stretching regimen. I want you to stretch out in the morning. And what you will find is that your spasticity is markedly decreased for the majority of the morning. I would also like you to stretch when you go back into your bedroom at night before you actually climb into bed. The value there is that you're much less likely to have spasms and cramps that will wake you up from sleep. Lastly, I need you to stretch once in the middle of your day. So during your lunch hour, maybe right when you get home from work, take five minutes and stretch out. If you do that, you're going to be constantly helping limit the spasticity and you're going to see benefit throughout the day and night. Now, the next thing I want to do is consider how long you can stay still before you get stiff. If you find that sitting for a half an hour to an hour does not result in you getting stiff, but if you sit for longer than an hour, you really start to tighten up, then you know that somewhere between a half an hour and an hour, you need to get up and walk around. I would actually recommend that you set an alarm on a smartphone and when it beeps, get up and do a lap or at the top of every hour, get up and do a lap. By doing this, you're much less likely to experience cramps and spasms in limbs that are hard to bend. You can apply the same logic when you're driving somewhere. You may find that a two hour drive results in you being so stiff, it's hard to get out of the car. What I would rather you do then is halfway through your two hour trip, one hour in, go to a rest stop, do a lap around the car or two, do some stretching, jump back in your car. When you arrive an hour later, you're good to go. Sometimes removing noxious stimuli, stretching three times a day, and staying moving every hour is not enough to combat your spasticity. And then we're gonna consider adding medicine to that. If you have a focal spasticity, just the hand as an example, then we would like to use a focal treatment for that. And we would use, for example, botulinum toxin or Botox. Botox is a poison to the muscle. And if you gave someone too much Botox, that muscle would not move for three months, which would stink. And obviously that's not the goal. We want to poison the muscle just a little bit, just to take away the oomph so that the opposing muscles can now overcome them. Remember when I was trying to drink this uh, carbonated water and the tricep wouldn't let go. And so my bicep wasn't strong enough to overcome the tricep. If we Botoxed my tricep a little, I would be able to overcome and bring my hand to my face and my tricep would still work and I could extend my arm out. And this can be applied to the muscles of the legs and the feet and the hands and the arms, etc. And Botox is a great way of dealing with a focal spasticity. We identify the muscle of interest, we shoot it, and that's going to provide a benefit typically for three months. So you stop by the clinic four times a year and you are set. Sometimes, however, it's not just a hand. It's not even just an arm. It's an arm and a leg, or it's all four limbs. And you can't Botox everything. And so in this instance, when you're dealing with regional or generalized spasticity, we can't use a focal treatment. We need to use something that's going to be systemic. And the first order is to consider a pill. For example, an oral antispasmodic like baclofen. So baclofen is a chemical compound that mimics a neurotransmitter in the body called GABA. GABA is the stop neurotransmitter. But when you have damage to the brain and spinal cord, you don't have enough GABA. It's not getting to the receptors in the back of the spinal cord, so you don't have enough stop neurotransmitter. Well, introduce baclofen. It's a pill of the GABA neurotransmitter. And you swallow it, and it builds up a blood level, and it can provide enough of that neurotransmitter so that that arm can relax. Now, baclofen lasts for about five hours. And so sometimes we're okay just taking baclofen at night when we're trying to deal with spasms and cramps and stiff legs at night. But sometimes we have spasticity throughout the day. And we may need to be taking baclofen twice a day or thrice a day. Sometimes I give people baclofen breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime. And by doing so, we can raise the blood level up and hopefully help them with their spasticity. Now, sometimes the dose of baclofen necessary to make them loose would also put them in a coma. They'd be asleep, which is not a good idea because when you take the oral baclofen, very, very little actually gets to your spinal cord. First, in your mouth, the amylase and lipase dissolve it. So you lose a little that way. Then you swallow it and it goes in your stomach where you have this massive stomach acid that eats away at a good portion of it. Fortunately, some of the baclofen pill gets into the bloodstream 
But then it goes through the liver and there's this phenomenon called the first pass phenomenon where the liver clears out more than half of it. So now you have a very small amount of oral baclofen floating around your bloodstream. But there's a problem because it has to go from the bloodstream across the blood-brain barrier into the central compartment where it can then help the spinal cord. That blood-brain barrier though is difficult because it's made up of fat. It's like a wall of fat. And baclofen is lipophilic or it loves fat. So it binds to the wall and it doesn't go through. At the end of the day, when you swallow a pill of baclofen, only 4% gets to your spinal cord. And so that's why sometimes the dose of oral medicine that we need is so freaking high that the side effects are overwhelming. If instead you have a baclofen pump set up, then you skip the amylase lipase, you skip the stomach acid, you skip the liver first pass, you skip the blood-brain barrier. These are brilliant little devices which can be surgically installed in your body and deliver microscopic amounts of liquid baclofen directly to your spinal column. Now, I can't fathom a human being saying, ooh, ooh, can you please install a computer in my body? And that is not the way that I would like to approach discussing a baclofen pump. In fact, I don't want to discuss a baclofen pump with a family. I want to discuss a baclofen test dose with a family. Let me explain. If a person meets four criteria, I will discuss or I will offer a baclofen test dose to test drive interthecal baclofen. The four criteria are number one, you're spastic. Number two, you don't like it. Number three, what's currently going on isn't working. And number four, you're a reliable person. So let's go through those. Not everyone who has trouble moving has spasticity. There are other movement disorders that someone can have, and we just need to make sure that the problem at hand is in fact spasticity. We can figure that out by taking a history and doing a neurological examination. The second thing is, is that you don't like it. Now, you could have spasticity, and that could be very helpful. If you have a weak left leg, but it's stiff, you can kind of use it like a peg leg, and it will allow you to ambulate. And you may need some tone in your leg because otherwise you might have trouble walking. Removing that tone in your leg would not be a good idea. This is an example of someone who has some spasticity, but they benefit from it. You could have someone who has spasms and cramps all the time, but doesn't want to take baclofen. And they tell you that the medicine side effects is worse than the symptoms. Okay. But if your spasticity interferes with your quality of life and if it interferes with your mobility and your freedom, then that bothers you. And then we need to be talking about possibly a test dose. Number three is what's currently going on isn't working. And what I mean by that is the stretching three times a day, the physiotherapy twice a week, the occupational therapy once a week, the walking once every hour, the taking the baclofen four times a day, taking a Xanaflex pill before bed, having some Botox, wearing a Dynasplint is not working. We need to be thinking about something else. And number four is you need to be responsible because when a person has a baclofen pump implanted, there are some precautions and some safety things they have to keep in mind. And so I can't have them running off and disappearing so if we identify someone, we will invite them to do an interthecal baclofen test dose. And so we bring them in the clinic in the morning and we write down their pain scores and their spasm frequency and we do an examination. And then I do a lumbar puncture where I insert a small spinal needle and I squirt in liquid baclofen and then I pull that needle out. That whole thing takes a couple minutes. And then the person hangs out with us the rest of the clinic day. And all day long, we go by about once an hour and we assess and we re ask them again, how are you doing with pain and spasms? And we re-examine them. And they learn firsthand and we learn secondhand what happens when you bathe the spinal cord in baclofen. Now, whether it's the best day of their adult life or whether it's the worst day, it's temporary because the spinal fluid is like a slow river and it's flowing and the baclofen flows with it. So in about six hours, you clear all that baclofen out. But we have a snapshot where we can find out if something like an intrathecal baclofen pump could help us. Spasticity is not very nice. It's a really unpleasant symptom, but we don't have to just accept it. On the contrary, there's a lot of things that we can do to treat spasticity. And I have a lot of other videos on this channel that talk about it. So if you would like to learn more about managing spasticity, click the video that's on your screen right now. And until my next video or my next live stream, or even better yet, the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, this is Aaron Boster saying be safe and take care.